Okay. Yeah, on, on the uh, patent subject, I'll let you know that um, the USPTO will grant anyone a patent that's willing to pay the price. So uh, it's, it sounds impressive, but uh, it's only impressive when they actually work. Um, so, um, you know, I'm probably not going to lean into the mic too much. I'm, uh, I get louder as I go on. So I, I've got this presentation, Learning to Learn, and I want to kind of tell you how I ended up at Lawrence and then I went, how I, uh, how I uh, ended up uh, starting my own company. And um, really, uh, it was a coincidence, so to speak, that I was in Florida speaking to the, uh, the Keen, um, uh, at the Keen seminar. Is anyone in the room familiar with the, the Keen uh, initiative and the, the, the Kern Family Foundation? It's a, it's a pretty uh, amazing story and you'll want to look into it after this talk, but uh, basically what it boils down to is a multimillionaire who has decided to uh, donate all of his money primarily to private institutions that um, foster entrepreneurship and engineering. Because um, uh, the bottom line is this, you're going to hear this a lot in the next couple of uh, months and over the next year, it's all about manufacturing, right? Everybody heard that? It's all about no, it's not all about manufacturing. Go upstream. It's all about engineering. It's all about product development. That's how you get to manufacturing. That's the, that's the secret. You hear that, cast the vote. You hear that, that, that uh, word coming out of somebody's mouth. But uh, the bottom line is uh, learning to learn. Uh, learning. Uh, knowledge or skill acquired by instruction or study. Instruction or study. I can't say uh, that fits me um, because uh, I'm more uh, in the modification of behavioral tendencies uh, by experience. And uh, one of the advantages I think that Lawrence had and still has is the uh, theory and practice. I, I can't tell you how, how real that statement is. It's theory and practice. And um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. So this is kind of the objective of the presentation. You know, to start off with, uh, who is this guy? My brief history. I want to give you a little idea of um, um, where I was prior to Lawrence. Um, so I was born in Saginaw, Michigan. Does anybody know where Saginaw is? Cool. <laughs> it's good to be in Michigan. <laughs> they say Saginaw. So I was born in Saginaw, Michigan. Uh, it's also a song by Lefty Fritzel. Great country hit. You can YouTube that. Um, so I went to Westdale Elementary School in Saginaw, Michigan where I was a budding artist. <laughs> in, in kindergarten, this is my first picture in kindergarten, it's a cat. Uh, and I, so I was, recognized, I was recognized as an artist, um, at least so my family thought. Um, but what they didn't recognize was my dyslexia. I don't know how it went undetected, but um, that is the signature in the corner. And um, this was the beginning of um, uh, a pretty serious learning disability. Um, that, um, that I managed to uh, uh, overcome uh, with the help of my father. My father was my mentor. My father was a, a mechanical engineer and was in the machine tool business and recognized that I was having um, some, some pretty serious issues in school and they didn't end uh, uh, up to graduation. But what he did was he kept me out of trouble and the way he kept me out of trouble was uh, interesting, uh, interesting me in the, in the things that uh, I propagated towards, and it was mechanical things, motors. He bought me a motor when I was in the sixth grade. It isn't actually this motor. I had to search the web and find this motor. If you look in the background, you'll see there's you know, a modern phone there. But he bought me a three horsepower Briggs and Stratton motor mounted to a piece of plywood. If anybody uh, remembers the 60s, um, uh, something called Dutch Elm disease came ripping through the Midwest and you woke every morning to the sound of chainsaws, and there were chainsaw laws. You couldn't start your chainsaws till 7 a.m. You had to shut them off at 6 p.m. And trust me, in the 60s, late 60s and early 70s, every community in the state of Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, woke to the sound of chainsaws. They cut down millions and millions of elms to try to arrest this. That's only important because that meant I couldn't start my motor till 7 a.m. I'd go, I'd go out to the back stoop of the house and wait till 7 a.m. I heard a chainsaw, I started my motor. So that thing ended up on go-karts, mini bikes, you name it. Uh, and it's all, you know, just, uh, it's an educational process. I'm learning about uh, 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 horsepower and I'm, I'm learning about speed, RPM. I'm learning about torque and how they combine to make horsepower. 
So that was the first phase. The second phase uh, was uh, my father decided to move, move me up in, in the world and uh, we bought a, a Model A, barely a Model A. Um, that thing was so rough it was unbelievable. No gla glass inside, no interior, no roof. But what this Model A represented to me was not only something that I could work on, tear apart, uh, put back together, but it was an education and design for manufacturability. You can learn so much by looking at, uh, at, at, the, uh, at the art, at studying the masters. This was without question uh, a masterful design. I remember in one particular case, uh, we were working on the interior of this car, taking out boards, and I took out one of the floorboards, and I was, I don't know, I was maybe ninth grade, eighth grade, and I chuckled and I said to my father, I said, look, one of the farmers used an old crate as a floorboard inside. It had all the markings on it and everything. My father chuckled and he said, no. He said, Henry Ford specified all of the crates that his raw goods came in. And when they received those goods, they'd open them up, take out the material on the inside and send the crate down the other end of the line. Green, we talk about green, he didn't waste a thing. So, you know, at that, at that period of time, it was an efficiency that, uh, that uh, uh, we could appreciate today. So basically, it's the beginning of my engineering studies. Uh, looking at, looking at the, uh, the, the way things were assembled and the way things th were designed. Uh, one other aspect of a Model A that's j just you know, mind-blowing at that time is uh, how you time it. You know how to time an engine. Looking at top dead center, number one cylinder, and, and uh, setting the gap and setting the spark. You had a little screw on the front of that, that engine block where you unscrew it and it had a bullet nose on it. You'd stick it backwards into that engine. You'd turn the crank until it popped into a hole. There was a timing hole on the timing gear that told you you were top dead center cylinder number one. You'd open the distributor, rotate it, tighten it down, you were done. Definitely designed for the user, the farmer. So a lot of education went into that car. That's the car that, uh, and in its final state, it was not pretty. But uh, it started and it ran. And uh, that's, that was the transportation to and from high school. So I got out of high school on what I call a, uh, uh, a um, uh, I don't know, sympathy degree. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't read, I uh, couldn't calculate a fraction. If somebody asked me how to add or subtract a certain percent on a, on a number, I really couldn't do it. Um, so with that knowledge, uh, my father got me into Northwood Institute. He knew the president, he knew I was a good kid. He said, give him a chance, let him go to Northwood. So I studied uh, uh, advertising at Northwood Institute. And uh, it was without question, not for me. I, I, I longed for something that was more tangible, more science-based. But in hindsight today, I rely on many of the lessons I learned from my advertising professor, Ron Ellis. He used to pound into our head, to whom, what, and how, to whom, what, and how. He was talking about advertising. How do you sell your product? Who are you selling it to? And how are you going to sell it? And, and those, those were really valuable lessons. Well, that didn't work for me. I didn't, I didn't, uh, didn't succeed at, uh, at Northwood Institute because you had to write. And I um, really couldn't write. Um, hadn't read a book yet at that point. Um, true. And so I decided to go to work at uh, the foundries in Saginaw. So I went to Gray Iron Foundry where I landed a job on Line 6. Line 6 was uh, very important because Line 6 had been opened in 1929 to cast the first in-Line 6 motors. We were still setting cope and drag by hand. This was great. You know what a cope and a drag is? The drag is the bottom half of the mold, the cope is the top half of the mold, and you ram the sand by, uh, by machine, pull a flask in, put a pattern in it, put the cope on the drag, send it down the line, pour the steel in. If there isn't too much moisture in the cope and the drag, you get a casting out. If there's too much moisture in there, that water goes to gas like this, and it pops out, and you've seen pictures of it. Looks like fireworks. So it was pretty cool. I mean, that's a good education. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's you know, very, very hands-on. So I worked at uh, Gray Iron Foundry for two years, at which point my father decided, my mentor, my father decided he was going to open his own engineering company. Up until that point, he had taught me um, the, the principles of drafting, and I learned quite a bit about design. I still didn't have any numerical values to put against it. It was all, it was all uh, uh, empirically driven. So I uh, joined my father in his engineering company as one of six draftsmen. And uh, I was very fortunate because he had, he had an incredible team that had been with him for 23 years. 
And anybody in the room ever worked for a parent's company? Okay. It is the opposite of easy. Because all the people there in that company are chartered with making sure that you earn everything you've, you ever get. And, and that was great. These were good guys, but they pounded some basic, basic principles into my head. This is my father, Dale Wright. And uh, that company became Wright K. It uh, was up in Saginaw, and it was a pretty uh, significant contributor to the auto industry. I left Wright K because, uh, as you can understand, um, I thought, well, I've got to, I've got to you know, grow a backbone and survive on my own. What do you do when you're a draftsman in the auto industry or in the machine tool business? And you're in Saginaw, Michigan. You go to Detroit. That's what you do. You, you want to find out if you're worth anything? Come to this town. Come to this town and try to survive in the, uh, uh, the auto industry as a draft person. So, my path to Lawrence University. I joined a group in uh, Madison Heights called Stellar Engineering. Anybody know Stellar Engineering? We had 500 people on the board. We competed with Modern. This is before Modern Engineering. This is before CAD. This is when you're rolling out 20-foot drawings and you're designing inline transfer machines for the auto industry or you're doing body in white or you're, then that's, you know, body before it's even seen sheet metal. Or when you're doing, um, and these might be familiar terms to the folks that are in the automotive curriculum or interested in the automotive industry. But um, it was, it was 56 hours a week, straight time. 10 hours a day, six on Saturday. It was great. This is 1980. Uh, in 1980, things weren't so, so good in the auto industry. But what was happening in the auto industry was they were retooling. They knew that when the industry was down, that was the time to retool. In 1978, you got four platforms that are front wheel drive. In 1988, you got 80% of the platforms front wheel drive. How did that happen? It happened by people retooling, reinvesting, and pumping their engineering knowledge into figuring it out. And we can talk all day about cars. But um, yeah, they had two experimental cars. And I'm not talking about the Eldorado and Toronado. Those were just anomalies in the, in the auto industry. Those were just General Motors having fun. It was the X-Body car, the Omega and the, and, the, and the Citation. And you know, can we really do this kind of stuff? Make two cars and see if it works. Well, there was a lot of benefit to it. So at Stellar Engineering, I was given a present. That, that, that changed my life. I was actually given two presents. I wanted from an engineering standpoint to show you this present. The other present was a book by, uh, by Ann Ran. My aunt gave me uh, uh, Atlas Shrug. And um, I highly recommend you read it. And uh, she gave me Atlas Shrugged in a dictionary. She said, I think you'll enjoy this. And I forced myself to read Ann Rand's Atlas Shrug. That was, that was my whole literary education, that one book. I probably spent more time in the dictionary looking up words uh, and, and figuring it out. I just forced myself to get through it because I knew what the alternative was. It's no fun not to be, not be uh, fluent in reading, it's, you know, to be uh, functionally illiterate to some extent. So I read that book. This calculator, how many people in here use an RPN, reverse Polish notation? This thing teaches you algebra. It does. You cannot function in this world without understanding algebra. It's number, enter, number, operation. Five, enter, three, divide. I mean, you can see it, you can hear it. And it's a stack, and the stack goes on forever. And because there are only four operands in, in algebra, you eventually execute something before you enter another number. You can't, you, it's, it's, it's really mandatory that you learn RPN. I really think so. It'll change the way you think. Once I got this calculator and started doing my daily calculations on the drawing board, I realized this is not a reach. This is not out of reach at all. It's time to go to Lawrence, because I knew of Lawrence, and seek admission. So I came to Lawrence, and I talked to an admissions representative. What do you call him? That's what I talked to, an admissions counselor. And he looked at my transcripts and looked at my, my, my background. He kind of he probably chuckled to himself and he said, he said, I'll tell you what, you go to OCC and you take your high school prerequisites and you get the grade in those courses and you come back here and we'll take you under probationary status. So I did that. So I went to Oakland Community College 
and I took my prerequisites. I did it in one year. And I came back to the admissions officer and I said, I'm ready to come to Lawrence. And um, it was a different school at that point. It was most definitely a different school. I'm so impressed with what I see here. I mean, I don't know if this was a cruel joke to bring me here and show me everything you guys do and then expect me to have anything important to say. And I'm, it's incredible what you guys are doing here. I have never seen in an undergraduate program the tools and the opportunities you have here. I haven't, and I've been to a lot of colleges, not as a student, but I haven't seen this. And so I went to OCC, and then I came back to the Lawrence I know. So this is the Lawrence that I came back to. Um, I put this other slide in here because I wanted to say I really prefer this one. <laughs> but uh, this is the one I, ca I came back to Lawrence. And while I was at Lawrence, I experienced something that I probably wouldn't have experienced anywhere else. And, and I do mean this. Um, I really look at my title of my presentation, Learning to Learn. It really was more like learning to compensate for the inability to learn. I never did figure it out. It just, you know, it's just determination. Um, uh, it was a culture of practice here. It really is. Do you guys hear that in your, in your curriculum? Practice over theory? You got a lot of hands-on opportunity here? You don't see that everywhere. You really don't. Staff with the industry experience. The other thing that blew me away on today's tour I saw so many faces that I saw in 1986. I really did. It took me a while to recognize a couple of them. We've all grown a little bit older. But um, Professor Frosch, is he in here? No, he's downtown. He was my thermodynamics teacher. I remember clearly, very clearly. It was his first year, it was his first course, and I remember very clearly on the first test when he walked around 20 minutes into it saying, you are clearly not ready for this test picking up papers from our desks. <laughs> he was clearly right. <laughs> so hands-on curriculum, on-campus resources, being able to, 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 to experience stress and strain in Young's modules of elasticity when you screw something up in a lab and it breaks in front of your very eyes. You know, it's, it's the, those things. And a, 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 the tolerance of chal uh, challenged students um, I don't think Professor Frosch remembers this, but I couldn't test in a classroom. I just, I don't, I don't know why, but just couldn't. I'm one of those guys that, you know, you hand me a form of the DMV, I freeze up. I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, I'm glad I've got my, my, my smartphone with me. I can look up things that I should know, like my address. You know, I just freeze up. So you let me take tests home. I mean, I had a, I, a Professor Nanny, like I had a calc teacher. I took every class twice, every Calc class twice. It, was, it wasn't an option. I just had to. You know, I was, if I wanted to get through them. And, and I had a teacher that let me take these, these test homes. He says, you clearly can't take a, a test. You can't figure out how to test in a classroom. Take a home. He says, spend one hour, don't open your book. And he knew, by the way, I performed on the test that I only spent an hour on it, and I surely didn't open a book. <laughs> so the ability of the staff. Um, Department heads in class, you don't get this. You, you don't get this anywhere else. I, and I keep, keep going on. I don't want to turn this into a, you know, a, a, a you know, group hug on, on what you got here. You, you just recognize it. I know you know it. You're here. You should be talking to people who aren't here. But, you know, small class sizes. I knew people by name. Day and night staff. This was really important. Um, I was doing contract work in the evening. Uh, to pay for class during the day. I wanted to go during the day. But there was an occasional class where I just needed to audit that class again at night. And several of the professors would do day and night classes. There's a hungry group. There's an entrepreneurial group of, of, of educators. So they'd be teaching in the day and they'd say, well, I've got a seven o'clock class tonight. I'd show up to that class and get the lecture again. And, um, and that was really beneficial. And the focus on undergraduates. It's an undergraduate school. Once again, you don't get I, I believe this. You don't get the exposure to the tools and the resources in an undergrad program like you do at Lawrence. I, I, I know that. We, my company, I'll show you what we do in the company in a minute when you're, you know, but we, we deal with a lot of universities. It's all graduate level stuff that I'm seeing. And, and it, it, 
it, it, you're on par with all of it. The tools I saw, just I was just floored with the tools. Um, it was amazing. Uh, the main state of the university is this undergraduate program. Doesn't mean that your graduate programs aren't important, but you come out of the you come out of the shoot here running. Uh, many working students. When I came to the school, there were a lot of working students, and uh, and I tell you what, there are a lot of students that work right now in this in this room that uh, forewent an opportunity to make a couple bucks to listen. I thank you, but you know it's it's tough when you're working and going to school. Flexible education practice, day and night classes, independent studies. When I was here, I, I developed my first bone cutting tool, and I was telling uh, a couple of people on the tour that you know I, I took up an, uh, uh, a, a load cell to a bridge port with a power quill and used that as my driving force and uh, cut bone and mapped the, uh, the, the force. And um, I was able to do that on an independent study. So uh, the, the first laminectomy wronger was developed here. Um, and out of class testing, that was what the, the, the other thing I mentioned. So with all that in mind, I, I want to tell you a little bit about my company, WI, and, and let you know what we do and, and how Lawrence uh, actually was the foundation of that. But I will say this, um, and I missed this when I was in Florida. During my sophomore year here, my father passed away. He was only 54 years old and uh, playing tennis and um, something he enjoyed. And, uh, but I lost my mentor. And I really had this love for medical devices, but I pretty much knew I was going to go back to Saginaw and work with my father in the machine tool business and the automotive business. But uh, out of that unfortunate event came an opportunity, which my father continuously gave me, opportunities. What do you want to do? Well, make medical devices. Why? Can I feel good about it. That's it. Am I in a position to do that? Hardly. You know, I'm struggling to get through Lawrence here and uh, grab as much education as I can. Never had a biology course. Never had a life sciences course. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. You're going you're to learn so much when you get on the job. And the, uh, the other interesting thing is opening a book, you can do it. You can do it anytime you want, any subject. You just open it up. And it's right there. And the accessibility to information today is tremendous. We all know that. So you can drive yourself in any direction you want. So. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my company, and, um, and in the process, I'll, I'll introduce you to um, um, a, uh, a, 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 my, my mentor today and how I ended up here right now talking to you folks. It was through that mentor at the Kern Family Foundation. Um, the process of product development is doing something you've never done before and doing it right the first time. Anybody can do it right the second time. Do you think somebody's going to pay you to do it again? I mean, you, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a case. And you know, you know how to do this. You've all done this at some point in, in your, in your uh, degree, during your, during your, in your personal life. Maybe it's restoring an object where you don't want to screw it up, so you actually do some research and figure out how to do it right. You do it right the first time. These are, these are the things we're talking about. It's not necessarily uh, uh, avoiding risk but it's educating yourself along the way so you know uh, how you're going to execute this. So, so when I say doing something that you've never done before, I mean where something is defined as an end goal. The end goal is not the steps along the way. By all means, fail on all those little steps along the way. And you're going to hear that when you get out into industry. Hey, they're going to say, we encourage failure here. Fail. Be careful how often you do that. <laughs> You know what? I do encourage it. I tell our clients, I tell our clients, we're going to fail so fast, it's going to blind you. But don't worry, because the cost of your program is really determined by time. If I run over my timeline, I will most definitely blow your budget. And if you're venture capital backed, private equity backed, or even backed by your own corporation, once you pass that, that mark you've put in the sand on your budget, it's never good. And, and, so, and so we say something is defined by an end goal. Uh, success is reached by climbing a series of rungs, each supported by a series of discrete efforts. The discrete efforts are comp uh, comprised of successes and failures on the bench, less than optimal prototypes, uh, undefined expectations. Now remember, when you're doing your prototyping and it's less than optimal, 
as long as you go into it consciously aware that it's less than optimal and that it has its limits, then you can, you can factor those elements out of your results. Um, unexpected results. Unexpected results can be good um, and, uh, and bad. Uh, parallel process development. And we'll talk a little bit about parallel process development and change in team dynamics. That happens. So the common threads of an entrepreneurial organization, they're vertically integrated. Does everybody know what vertically integrated means? Show me some hands. If you, if you, if you know what it means, I want to see. I, I just, is it, you know, a vertically integrated company is like Henry Ford's River Rouge plant. They're definitely vertically integrated. Raw material in one door, finished product out the other. Vertically integrated. They made their steel. They made their glass. They made their product. They were focused on their product, not a horizontal organization that's, that's focused on processes. Whatever process they needed, that was on their critical path. That was their vertically integrated company. And there are some companies like the Patagonia company right now. They, they, they own their own uh, uh, sheep. They own their own cotton. They own their own, they, 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 they manage their materials coming in. So focus, yet uh, flexible. Uh, and unconventional cultures, okay? Unconventional cultures. This is, this is my personal belief. Of course it is. You know, everything I'm saying is my personal belief. Um, you can share it. Um, Stephen Jobs was a genius. He really was. But that doesn't mean that everybody who throws their stapler against the wall and rants up and down the hallway is by God of genius. You know, that's not the element of, of genius. That's just what he did. So now a lot of executives are using it as an excuse to, you know, behave that way. That's not, that's not at all the message there. So unconventional cultures can mean a lot of things. At WI, our unconventional culture is, I'm in Colorado. I've got a young staff. They want to snowboard and they don't want to do it on the weekend because the traffic going up to the mountains is really bad. They'd much rather take Wednesday and Thursday off and go snowboarding. That's what they do. So I don't believe in snowboarding. Skis, that's where it's at. Unconventional environments. D d d environments that would, we do a team thing. Anybody go to summer camp and you got the buddy system when you're swimming in the lake? They blow the whistle and you're supposed to find your buddy and hold up their hand. If you don't have a hand to hold up, then you got to get a new buddy. <laughs> that's, what we, that's what we do. We, um, we, we team people up. Everybody's in a, in, a, in a duplex office, so you can hear. And they're not necessarily on the same program. They can overhear one another, and they keep each other in check. And we've even used this across companies where we assign buddies at, the, at, their, at our client's location. We'll say, hey, listen, I know it's going to be project manager to project manager talking and business owner to business owner talking, but let's put a couple people at the grassroots level talking, authorize them to talk, and encourage them to talk so that I can occasionally get a message to my desk. Hey, guess what? What you think we're doing, what they think we're doing, we're not doing. That's really important. Um, a highly passionate staff. You, uh, you, can, you can get that. It's a reflection of how you treat your folks. Uh, weird, or we like to say different. So uh, my company was, now I'm going to try to get off these boring slides, the blue ones here, and show you pictures and stuff. Uh, the company is founded in 2001, and our core companies, our clinical our competencies, our clinical awareness, the cross-functional team, um, that means electricals, mechanicals, life sciences, PhDs, manufacturing. It's a small company. It's only 25 people. But we have a very, we have a very eclectic group of people who are, are um, uh, cross-trained in many different areas. Our focus, our focus is in vitro diagnostics, and I'll show you some of those things. Like, I see I'm losing you guys, getting a little tired. Like this, like this. This is a point of care AIDS test. This is a flow cytometry on card. This takes a $250 test and turns it into a $2.50 test. That was for the World Health Organization. Bill and Melinda Gates funded, and then another group in Austin. And that's an isothermal PCR card. This is a lab on a card. So this is a $25 card. This, is, this detects MRSA in one hour. So in one hour with the sample, pop it into a machine, and, then, and I'll show you how that works. That's the kind of stuff we're doing in the in vitro diagnostics area. In organ perfusion, we made the first organ that transports a kidney, keeps it alive during the tr uh, transport. We've been written up in a couple magazines, but more important, our products have been published from our customers. So a couple of uh, awards and acclimates and some of the companies we do business with. And some of them are big, some of them are small, some of them are out of business. So um, that's the way it goes. So the process we do is we go from a concept, and you recognize this is a typical SolidWorks file, to a finished product in-house. 
and I'll show you how we do that. And uh, the vertically integrated process. So this is a good point to tell you that when I hired into 3M Cardiovascular in Ann Arbor, Michigan, making heart lung machines and artificial hearts and things of this nature, I met my mentor, Dr. Tim Crewall. Dr. Crewall was my boss at 3M Cardiovascular. And like, uh, my, like m most students, I got to the point with Dr. Crewell where I'd learned everything I could possibly learn from him, so I quit and went to Medtronic. And about a couple months into Medtronic, I thought to myself, oh my God, I wish I had Tim back. Well, the opportunity came to me about nine months later. Uh, they said, who would you have as your boss? I said, Dr. Crewall. And so they hired Dr. Crewall into Medtronic and became my boss again, my mentor again. And that was great. Uh, next time we parted, it was because I started a company and he went on to the mothership to become vice president of Medtronic. He's a smart guy. He's an educator. He, 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 was, an, he was a professor at University of Michigan and he got into uh, industry and he practiced academic uh, 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 methods in private industry. It worked real well for him. Well, Dr. Crewall uh, became my mentor and to this day is my mentor. Uh, I practice what Thomas Edison practiced at the Menlo uh, Park. And this is the Menlo Park. You can go see this Menlo Park. It's right here. I highly recommend Is anyone gone to Greenfield Village to walk through the Menlo Park lab? It is way cool. It's intense. I mean, that is, that is the, the hot spot of, uh, of 1890. That's it. You can just sort of stand in there, close your eyes, and take it in. I mean, you know, there's, there, you know it seems like there are two camps out there, Tesla and Edison, Tesla and Edison. You know, uh, if you know both of them, theory and practice, theory and practice. The, the bottom line, though, is, you, you, you know, you can question somebody after uh, uh, 20 patents, maybe 50 patents, you know, 1,000 motion pictures, light bulbs, rubber. I mean, you, know, you start looking into the, 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 the things that he contributed to and the people he hung out with. No question he had a formula here, and it was a cross-functional team. And, and he drove that team pretty hard, and that team was very successful. That's what they did then. So this is what we practice. We practice a vertically integrated process at WI. How are we doing on time? Good, because I don't want you to miss the fun stuff. This is pretty boring. So what we do is we go from, an, in the in vitro diagnostic mark, we go from a basic assay to a finished product. So somebody comes to us and they say, they say to us, I've got this assay, and when I take blood and I spin it down and pull off the red blood cells, the RBCs, and keep the white blood cells, lymphocytes, leukocytes behind, and then I take uh, fluorophore tagged antibodies and pop them in there and mix it up and let them incubate a little bit and then flush the unbound antibodies off and put it on a slide and put it underneath the scope and count it. I can enumerate some cluster of differentiation. Put that on a card. And so that's what we do. We take that and we go through the process of defining that assay, the basic assay design. And we have scientists in the house that can look at the time, the temperature, the pressure, the collection, the introduction, uh, reaction, mixing, incubation, filtration, uh, detection scheme, and then disposal. Disposal is pretty interesting. Uh, this right here being a PCR card that works on DNA, it has to be isolated. You don't want to contaminate the machine. You don't want a lot of stray DNA residing in the machine. So, you know, it's pretty basic stuff. So. You just figure out how to make that little manufacturing work cell. This is nothing but an assembly line. Take it from the auto industry. It's an assembly line. Blood in here, detection window here, a lot of things in between doing their job. So, ooh, is that the end? Okay, we're done. Um, okay, are we live? Great. So the next thing is, once they give you that assay, once they give us that assay, we say, okay, now, We've got to look at the sequence, and I kind of jumped the gun there. We look at the assembly line. We figure out how these things come together. So we put some structure to it. And it's not the only way you can do it. We just look at multiple ways to, uh, to put structure to that assay. And we assign different paths, and we assign different uh, uh, protocols. So once we assign that assay some type of sequence, we look at sample port, wicking, sample segmentation, uh, sample filtration, rehydration of, uh, of dried down uh, uh, biochemistry, and so forth. Uh, dwell and incubate, flush, read, detect, discard. And from that point, now you're in a position, this is where the engineering gets fun. Now you've defined your parameters. Now you're in a position to say, I'm going to put structure to this. How is this going to come together? Um, this card right here is three layers. Uh, a company came to us with a genome mapping card. It worked. 
So they had their assay under control. But the card they had was 18 layers of PSA, pressure-sensitive adhesive, with multi-layers in between, and they had nonspecific protein binding issues. They had shelf life because this viscoelastic adhesive would elute uh, chemicals into the process based on how you stored it and changed the surface chemistry and changed the surface energy. I mean, you know, that's what, that's what adhesive is a giant magnet for surface energy, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna mess things up. So they came to us, not to have our genius uh, uh, create this assay, but they came to us saying, how can we make this easier? We turned that 18 layer card into a three layer card. And we did it with the, the processes we'd learned in the past, and we put that together uh, using very clean processes with no adhesive. So that's the concept uh, development, where you, you chase down the different architectural uh, answers to your, your problem. So reduce the concepts to functional level. Uh, you assess the merits of each concept. That's the fun part. Um, do you guys participate in brainstorming sessions? And, 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 and in, a, in a healthy functional brainstorming session, there are no bad ideas, but don't miss the opportunity to laugh at some. So um, we do. We have little dark guns, and you know, if somebody says something really ridiculous, we, rec we record it, but then we shoot them. So, um, <laughs> Uh, but it's fun, and it's an encouraging thing to do. You assign real properties and materials. Assign the real properties and real materials. Now here's, if you take nothing else from, from this talk, this is really important. In my business, it's everything. Use native materials, use native processes. You can picture a little piece of plastic, and you can picture in a CNC mill, milling out little microfluidic channels. I guarantee to you, that those milled channels will not act anything like a molded card. They will flow great, the surface energy will be different, the binding properties will be different. It's not the same material because you've cut those polymers and they're standing on end and the energy's different. Everything's different. And it looks so simple. It looks so obvious. I'll just machine the card, get the geometry right, and go right to a mold. We skip the machining, we go right to the mold. And the way I sell that, I say, I say to the customer, I say, hey, well, listen, We'll go ahead and design it, we'll machine it, we'll test it, and that'll be thirty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. Then we'll go into a mold and try to figure out why it doesn't work. How about we just put it in the mold to begin with, and if it doesn't work, we throw that mold away. I'm closer to the end goal. And so we convince them, once again, going back to that, that at the beginning, we convince them that the best way to control their budget is to fail soon and, and, and fail in such a way that it adds equity to their product. It adds equity to the, to the process of product development. So we exercise parameters, invest in concepts, and we avoid spatial cerebral prototyping. Spatial cerebral prototyping is when you think about it so much, you pretty much understand it. You ever done that? It's so, it's so vivid in your mind. You can rotate it in space. You can zoom in. You can zoom out. You can put it in perspective. You can even stretch it. You can break it. Everything is there. You've got your own finite element analysis going on in your head. Don't trust it. There's something out there called gravity. And it's in your head, you know, but not to the extent that it will be in the, uh, the end product. There, there are so many things out there that you can't factor into it. I'm not, I'm not saying don't think about it to, to a length to end, but I'm just saying don't use that as your final answer. Here's what we do at WI. Every concept gets recorded. Every concept gets recorded. We talk about the pros. We talk about the good things. What do we expect from this concept? We talk about the cons. We talk about what does this concept not give us? And then we say, what does the feasibility work? To validate my pros, validate the cons, or move one from one column to another. Doesn't that look simple? It looks simple, doesn't it? We've had huge companies come to us where we've delineated concepts in this format and given them to them, and they look at that, they look like they've never heard of such a thing before. Holy smokes. How, you, how do you pick? Well, you don't pick right then. You test them all. You go down the road to figure, yeah, you, you go down the road to figuring out which one's best. And, and I had a friend tell me back in like 1980, 81, he says, good ideas complement themselves. You start getting benefits you never expected. Bad ideas, they keep insulting themselves. Pretty soon you find yourself putting a flying buttress against one wall to keep the wall up, and you have one on the other side, and all of a sudden you realize that's, you know, you, 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 you're putting, you know, straps and all sorts of things around the idea, and you, pretty soon you go, 
oh, maybe this wasn't so clean. It, looks, it looked very clean at the beginning. That's okay, you know, move on from that. Then you get into the industrial design portion. Okay, so you're gonna learn a little bit about me right now. Industrial design is very, very important. Uh, but form follows function. Don't make it pretty before you make it work. Okay, understand the physical constraints. Mock up the geometry with components in hand. I can tell you one situation in one product where the board of directors have been sold a box. No joke, they've been sold a box. It was blue and it had a screen and it had a, it had an, uh, a, a, a slot in the front and you were gonna take a card that had not yet been designed. You were gonna pop it into this box and an optics system, which had not yet been designed, was gonna count the cells. Well, and what reality set in, this is 2005. We got a 10 megapixel camera in 2005. You can go to Walmart, get 20 right now for 90 bucks. In 2005, you were paying through the nose for a 10 megapixel camera. <laughs> The box was about one and a half times larger because of the octic stack and column. They couldn't accept it. The board of directors could not accept it. No, that's not the box we signed up for. It, we're talking about detecting CD4 and AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa. Are we really gonna worry about the height of the box? Yeah, put the cart before the horse in this case. Finally got around to it, the curve in, in, in maturation curve in technology by 19, or 2009, took care of that problem, but it was not fun. So focus on the end user, account for failure modes. And then it's a medical device, make it blue. So it's really sad. How about yellow? No, make it blue. Orange? Uh, no, so they're all blue. Okay, walk into a hospital. You know, usually in the hospital, you're not focused on the equipment because let's face it, you're not there for fun reasons you yourself or whomever you're with. You know, you're not sitting around looking at things. Maybe you are. If you are sitting around looking at things, talk to me afterwards. So, um, <laughs> you know, why the, you know. But, but, so, guess what? We made it. We made it to engineering, okay. Everything was prior to engineering. The engineers were involved in everything prior to engineering. We finally got to engineering. This is what we tell our customers. When we start designing, you're committed. You have made a commitment a big commitment. You're spending serious dollars on designs that are gonna go out and get fabricated and come together and get screwed together and they're gonna go into the lab and we're gonna start pumping in, uh, resources into it. When you're at this point, you're creating specifications. Now a lot of people confuse those terms. My mentor pounded it into my head and today, today I run into this challenge and I decide with each, with each customer, do I really want to educate them on what I've been educated or do I just want to sort of like go with their lingo? And a lot of times I just go with their lingo. Requirements are at the front end, requirements. Specifications are the function of engineering. You, you, you inspect to specs, that's what you do, okay? You specify the geometry, you specify the shape. Your requirements dictate where your specifications are gonna end up. And I tell you, it's been more times than not when somebody comes to us with a sheet of requirements and their requirements spell out indirectly what the specification should be until you show them a concept that breaks the rules. And they look at their requirements and they say, holy smokes, requirements 6, 9, and 11, we don't need any more because your concept mitigated a need for them. Make it cleanable, why? Because I don't want somebody to get cross-contaminated. Can I make it disposable? I didn't know you could do that. We can. Okay then, I don't need to make it cleanable. It's just, that's how it works. So in engineering, geometry follows process. CAD software lies. <laughs> it lies all the time and it doesn't even care. It will set you up and it will just sit there and won't even break a smile. It'll just, just sit there like it's, like, holy smokes, you put the parameters in, I just gave you the picture, okay? How did I know that you couldn't do negative draft? How did I know you wouldn't get an absolute inflection point of, of zero radius? Yeah, it does. So here's my CAD data, my CAD data is wonderful. I need this microfluidic channel. I need it because I need that little pocket and I need all those sharp edges and I want everything that I, you see there. 
And then I send that out and I get it tooled and I open up my box when the shipment comes in and what is this? I've got radiuses where I didn't ask for radiuses. And my supplier says, are you serious? I'm pushing material into a mold and it's got, you know, at corners and things that it can't fill because you've got molecular structures of geometry that don't go down to zero. You know, it's got dimension. So what you do, the point here is work within the parameters of your process. If you're designing something and you decide and you decide that you want to invent new process, do it, but do it for the right reason. Do it because that new process is, is absolutely critical to the product you're trying to make. But if you can avoid putting a subsequent invention on the critical path, do it. Because it's a drag trying to invent new process when you're also trying to invent a new product. Um, so, include suppliers and design reviews, employed analytical tools like FEA, computational fluid dynamics, etc. Employ those tools, but trust your intuition. How many people have worked with finite element analysis in this room? Okay, and you know how that works. You set up a structure and you apply constraints and you bend it in, in a CAD software and it, it lights up and it tells you where the high stress is. Everyone who's used finite element analysis in this room has experienced when they look at that CAD and they, that terminal and they go, that's not right. Something's not right. Oh my God, I got a constraint backwards. I got tension where there should be compression and compression where there should be tension. You knew it, you know, you're up here, you're doing, you're doing it up here and you're saying, I better fix this. I better, I better run this through the old noggin again and figure out what's going on here. One of the two is, is in conflict. And then as you're an engineer, you might as well make it blue. So, so this is a platelet function test, prototype and analyze. And I'm going to show you some fun products here, I hope. Choose processes based on performance. Understand the deviations. When you can't when you can't use the process that you want, because you got one shot at it, when you've got only one shot at using a process, at least be conscious of the deviations you're making when you're not using that process. Conscious omission. By the way, when, when a customer comes to us and says, we want this, this is what we want in a product, quite often we say to them, what do you not want? What, what is this not gonna do? In, in my world, in my world, people come to us and they say, I need a prototype, I need to check to test feasibility. Here's the killer in my, in my business. I say, are you gonna use this clinically? Are you gonna use this on a human? And they say, well, no, that's not our intention. You gotta be able to read between the lines because you get uh, halfway through the project and you meet with success. And they say, wow, we didn't expect to have this much success. We wanna go to humans. I say, oh, we're gonna back out a lot of things that we did here. We're gonna back out a lot of things and add constraints that allow us to go to human. And that's you know, it's two different worlds, two different timelines. So um, correlate the deltas, uh, exercise processes, verify prototypes, verify processes. This is getting boring, I don't know if you're bored. But um, we're testing the device. I'm gonna show you some devices and we'll talk about it. Test it like it's real. This is Dr. Pablo Sanchez. This is our blood lab and he's hooking an organ up to a uh, perfusion network to um, perfuse the organ. I'm gonna show you this organ in a couple minutes um, on a video. But um, we test it like it's real. We draw blood in-house, we work with blood and organs and tissue, and um, that gives us an, an incredible advantage. We're not an engineering firm, we're a product commercialization firm in the medical device arena. And engineering is a critical component to it. So uh, build it, pilot build it. That's Dominic Aiello, uh, one, of my, uh, one of my engineers, been with me now seven years, hired right out of school. Here's a story about Dominic, it's a good story. Dominic followed one of my engineers in one day. And I was sitting in my office and I saw him come in and I said, who's the kid? He said, this kid wants to learn CAD, he wants to learn SolidWorks, he can't find a job, so he's just gonna mentor me for a week. So I kind of watched this and I thought to myself, I don't know if I could have people coming in here that aren't being compensated and you know, contributing. He was contributing, detailing little parts. So I went over and talked to him a little bit and uh, said, what are you trying to do here? You know, learning CAD, blah, blah, blah. I said, how about if I just pay you a little bit and um, you hang around and you contribute and you learn. So this is uh, uh, last week. 
or two weeks ago, he's loading a part into a laser welder. It's our proprietary laser welder that uh, joins plastic, and he's one of my top engineers that, uh, uh, to this day, uh, I put on the tough stuff. So Dominic right now is uh, using real processes, building to procedures, using qualified parts. It's discipline. That's what I'm talking about here is discipline. Uh, you're going to go through it anyway. Discipline yourself to go through it early. Uh, treat the build as a final manufacturer. Even when you're prototyping, do it as much as you can. And there's the final product, finished product. So let's see. Project examples. It's blue. <laughs> um, we hired a firm called IDEO. Anybody ever heard of IDEO? They're like the rock stars of industrial design. They are. They got books in the market and how they do it, and they're centrifuge. Yeah, they got all sorts of words they make up. They take two words and put them together, and then coin them and trademark them, and then they use them for a while, and they make up new words. But they're good. Ideal's good. That's the first organ transporter that keeps a kidney alive outside of the body. It's, it's really quite simple. But technology came together. The energy density came together so that you could actually perform what you needed to perform in a, in a portable device. And the laptop really contributed to that being able to use laptop batteries. But that is an extracorporeal circuit. Extracorporeal, corporeal body extra outside of, in addition to. So extracorporeal circuit, like having a heart and lung machine, that pumps fluid, an acellular fluid, through the kidney, uh, keeps it uh, um, open, flushed, and treats it with drugs. And um, it took the transport time from seven hours to 72 changed everything and that was our first project we uh, we made a call on a, a, a colleague out in in uh, utah and they had been bidding on this job from a software standpoint and i don't touch software i don't touch software and i make that very clear i know who to call i won't do it there are too many experts out there so you gotta focus so we called this group up and said hey we desperately need work and he said, well, listen, why don't you bid on this job with us? So we bid on this with Oregon Recovery in Des Plaines, Illinois. And um, we were pretty desperate at the time, uh, three months into nothing, and uh, after opening the company. And they gave us this project. We executed this project from concept to production tooling, <coughs> from concept to finished tooling in nine months. And um, uh, they're a customer of ours today. But it's a very simple job. Mechanical engineers in the room, it's pumps. It's pumps that manage occlusion, it's filters, it's back pressure, it's, uh, it's temperature, it's pressure, it's air bubble mitigation. That's what it is. It's a very simple platform. So basically it's a startup company and the objective to create a disposable with transfer costs of less than $65. 11 months to completion on a, uh, on a budget with six patents. So this is another very cool thing. Th this one's very exciting. This is early in our company's focus. Um, this is a medication dispenser. A father and a son from Alabama that had made their money in insurance wanted to build a medication dispenser for their mom, grandmother and mother. And, um, and uh, they came to us with this idea. They're going to take a whole bunch of drawers, seven across, one for every day, about four down, and they were going to have all these drawers open up and ring when it was time to take the medication. And we showed them where that had been tried before. The problem is you got to load every one of them, the whole shot. So what we did was we did, they went away, and we did a little research. And this was kind of fun. We did a little research, and there's a company in Chicago called AutoMed. And if you send them your prescription, they'll give you your prescription back on a reel like this. You pull it out, and every date and time is marked with your meds in it. Pretty cool, huh? On a reel. And it doesn't cost any more. It actually costs less. They do cross uh, comparisons of, uh, uh, of uh, interference for drugs. So I called my brother, my patent attorney, and I said, has anybody patented the tail end of this thing? He says, not at all. We took that reel, we popped it into a machine, made an automatic feeder that's cell phone enabled, calls you, calls your, your, your caregiver. It, it, it wakes up and it says, hey, it's time to take your drugs in your own voice or in one of your children's voice. And the, the guys were off to the races. 
We made uh, 100 machines for them. They put them into an assisted living facility. Every one of the rooms has it. They got a central computer at the desk. They can sit there and watch this activity. They use it in drug studies for AIDS drugs. They can call up the machine and say, stop the protocol. Machine stops. Double the protocol. You know, stop, they change the protocol. So it was just a fun program. It was early in our development. This is the AIDS test, the CD4 test. And this is really, really quite simple. Um, the company that, that contacted us to do this knew about our ability to process membranes. Uh, Rob Fletcher and I go back to a company called Gelman Sciences. I honestly, goodness, didn't recognize Rob because, see, Rob had gotten older and I hadn't. And, um, <laughs> and so I thought, maybe this is the same Rob Fletcher I work with in Ann Arbor, Michigan. But in Ann Arbor, Michigan, we worked for Gelman Sciences, which is the Paul Corporation, and what we did was we sealed membrane. And we sealed membrane. And all day long, we sealed membrane. All different types of membrane. And it's not easy. Because making the membrane with a specific pore size, that's half the trick. Now you've got to seal it without screwing it up. And it's really difficult to seal membrane without messing it up. That's where you kind of pinch it, hold it, whatever. You compromise the membrane. So we knew how to do that. This company found out about us and said, can you seal this membrane? So we took this little track etch membrane with three micron holes in it and we sealed it to the card. We were five people at that time. And they said, wow, nobody else was able to do that. We'll invest in you. You go out and find the PhDs and find the, 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 uh, the biochemists and you bring them into your company and build the life sciences component around your technology. They did that for us. That happens. They said, we'd rather stick with you and your methodologies and go find somebody else that already has the skill sets but doesn't have your methodology. So we build a company around this one card a finger prick of blood in the entrance uh, port. It wicks up three microliters. It hits a little geometry that we designed in here that stops the capillary action. We call it capillary interruptus maximus. And it just stops it right there, a little arrow. And they stick this thing into a machine, which is a little bit taller than the machine they brought to us, and it bursts a blister. And that blister pushes the blood over the track of membrane, and the red blood cells go into the back. The white blood cells stay behind. The next blister bursts and it rehydrates fluor 4 tagged antibodies. And they flush into the window and they incubate for a time. And then you flush the un unbound antibodies and you turn on the camera and you count three different clusters, CDs, clusters of differentiation, and you enumerate CD4. And it tells you the progression of AIDS. And then you know what kind of therapy to administer to arrest it without overdosing. So that was the CD4 test. This is the MRSA test that we developed for our company. Um, it is, once again, it's a lab on card. It's not MEMS. It's pretty gross. You see, it's pretty macro in relative terms. Uh, it takes a little uh, 10 microliter sample, goes into the port, you close it, stick it in the machine, and the machine does its thing. It bursts a blister, pushes a sample in. It, uh, it, uh, it's isothermal, so there's no thermocycling in this, but it mixes, it washes, it uh, replicates. And um, the assays and the buffers are all on board. Now, with this card, the customer came to us with a really unique challenge. They said, we're really not sure how to execute this assay. We know that we can do it several different ways. As an engineer, beware when you hear that. Because what that means is they want flexibility. And they wanted flexibility. They wanted to be able to articulate every component of this, this product independently. So we did that. And we built this machine, seven months, hardware and disposable, and got them in business. And it was exciting. So this is the lung machine. And this is where I'm, gonna, I'm going to show you a little video. A company came to us and they said, we believe that if we pump an acellular material through a lung at normal temperature and treat this lung uh, with a ventilator system and pull off the oxygen that comes out of the lung and put in CO2, treat the lung like it's in a body, we think we can change, uh, change the outcomes in, in single and, and double lobe um, transplant. And they're pretty reputable. Um, you guys hot at all? I'm burning up. So, so what we did um, was, yeah, I'm getting excited actually. Um, so what we did was we met with the, the surgeon at University of Toronto and we learned his protocol, and we came up with a sketch, a sketch in the uh, upper left-hand corner, and said, that's kind of what we envision. And you see in the right-hand side, that's the machine. That's the machine that keeps a lung alive outside of the body, 
And this is a picture of the lung in the machine. You can see the ventilator's hooked up, and you can see the perfusion system's hooked up. And we're going to jump to that in a second, and I'm going to show you something here. This is, this is just for uh, being so patient. Let's see. Does anybody see the, uh, there we are, it's right here. Okay. Okay, so here we are. This is at TEDMED. So what you're going to be hearing is Dr. Schaff describing this. So we do have audio on this. Um, a count of the body for a period of time and expose the different stresses in, 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 in the recipient. We also wanted to say, can we teach that organ? Can we modify it so it looks more like self? So when you put it in to a new recipient, that recipient doesn't reject it. The problem with our paradigm was the fact that we, we would have the organ in the donor and we had very little time to assess it and very little time to work on it and fix it. So when we developed ways to genetically modify the organs, we were able to, to do this, but only in a few organs. We then set out to develop a system that you see here, where we could keep the organ outside the body at normal temperature so that we can actually assess its function, we can work on it and treat it with, with drugs, with medications, and with sophisticated therapies like gene therapy, like cell therapy. And what you're looking at here is a pig lung that we retrieved this morning in, 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 in a similar technique that we retrieve lungs for human transplantation today. The lungs are put on the circuit where they're breathing with a ventilator. The breathing tube here goes into the, into the airway of the lung. And it's breathing just like a patient on a ventilator. So that program was executed from concept, tubing on the floor, I call it. Tubing on the floor at the University of Toronto and turned into four machines in clinical use under a PMA with the FDA in 18 months. Nobody touches that. Nobody does that. I know it. My competition knows it. The other people in the perfusion business know it. That was incredible. Now just a little footnote, getting back to Detroit, you saw that machine with the skins, the, 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 uh, uh, the enclosure? Those were made by Jack Roush in Roush Racing. Had a few connections, I called them up and I said, I know you guys make skins, I saw you last week at Talladega. You hit the wall. So, I know you're making skins, so make me some skins. And they, they made the fiberglass skins and they made them under the proper processes that allowed us to roll that machine in to, uh, to an, an OR. And there's a requirement called, uh, uh, God, I'm gonna blow it, uh, uh, IPEX-4 standard. And don't ask me what the uh, acronym stands for. It's an international standard for fluid ingress. It had to take a shower head, certain liters per minute, horizontal into all of those pumps and mechanisms for 10 minutes without ingress into the machine. But the auto industry can deal with that. That's nothing to them. You know, us medical people, we whine about that stuff. The real genius is in the auto industry. Talk about taking a hard lung machine across railroad tracks at 60 miles an hour, leaving it outside at negative 20, starting it up, taking it to Phoenix at 120. That's some engineering. That's some real engineering. That don't take us too serious. So this is the last product I'm going to show you. This is, this is the one that I just feel like probably I'm just going to call it quits after this. So a company came to us. And he said, I've got this solution. That little vial right there is about this big. He said, I've got this solution, and if I inject this solution into a patient undergoing MRI, I see all cancerous cells. I can measure the metabolic rate of the cancerous cells. And I can apply therapy and watch the metabolic rate change and watch them die. And Really, in my company, we do have a requirement. It's got to be a real medical device, okay? It has to be something that the FDA sees as a medical device and is recognized as a medical device in Europe. So if somebody comes to you and tells you they got that cocktail, you question them. I didn't question them. It was GE. 
They know what they're doing. They said, that's the good news. They said, here's the bad news. So, you know, sitting on the edge of my chair. They said, it's food. It's pyruvate. It's pyruvic acid. It's what the cancerous cells eat at an order of magnitude greater than any other cell. And what we do is we trick it. We put a little, we put a little flag on it called C13, carbon-13. We hyperpolarize the carbon-13 in the three tesla, four tesla magnet. But we do that at 0.8 Kelvin. <laughs> oh. Okay, so you mean like the 0.8 Kelvin is co colder than the universe? That Kelvin, 0.8 Kelvin? Yeah, that 0.8 Kelvin. So they said, oh yeah, and the solution that's in there is at 1.7 pH. Great. <laughs> Great. Is there anything else I should know? <laughs> I say, they say, yeah, there's another thing. We hyperpolarize this at 0.8 Kelvin, it's 1.7 pH, and then we shoot a fluid into that vessel that's 130 degrees Celsius under 250 PSI. <laughs> okay, sign us up for this, because I want to put all the liability in my company on this science. And they said, oh, there's one more caveat. <laughs> the stuff we're pumping in there that, that helps us hyperpolarize it is a toxin, and we have to flush it out of that solution, and we have to neutralize the pH and once we flush this EPA out and neutralize this solution, it has a 63 second half-life to get it in the patient. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you guys are finding the humor in that. Because most people would get lost at Kelvin. Is that, is, that, is that like the comic strip Kelvin? No, that's like the other Kelvin. That's like the negative form or whatever it's a negative. So, so it's being used today on patients. University of California, San Francisco. Three and a half years. And what we did was we developed the disposable. This little vial is a component in the entire disposable. And the machine you see next to it is a hyperpolarizer. And you take that disposable and you couple it into that hyperpolarizer and you push go. It has four channels. It produces every four hour, or every one hour, four samples for four patients. And that machine sits next to the MRI room. And it's going to change everything. It's going to change everything. If you get the competition in this, in this market trying to figure out what they're going to do next, it's too late. The game's over. This is MRI. This is not PET. This is not bombarding your, your body with things that actually have an adverse effect themselves. So this is an MRI machine with a hyperpolarizer sitting adjacent to it. And the QC system that I talked about is adjacent, is, is coupled to that machine. We look at the four parameters. We know go, no go. We know if that's a good sample. We know if that's something you want to inject into a patient. And this machine, like I said, is being used at UCSF. And it's going through its second human trials in, in June. And there are six more of them on the dock. Now, the other component to this, this little piece of science is that you actually have to ship the sample cold from manufacturing, from the pharmacy, at negative 20. I didn't know this. I thought I knew something. And I didn't know this. I know even less now I visited your campus. So um, there are people that do that all the time. I didn't know that. I've been working in oncology for a while. There's a, they, they, big companies out there that, that ship frozen stuff all over the U.S. and Europe and everywhere. I, I should have known, but negative 20, no problem. So we made a call to a, a specialty pharmacy group uh, that was a couple to a company called Amerisource Bergen. And uh, I, had my, I was blown away. Visited their resource center in, in Dallas, Texas. And I walked into a room about this big with desks going down to about this level here. And all sorts of TV screens in the wall. Is there a situation room where they watch weather patterns. And they look for disasters. Because the last thing a company like that's going to do is be caught not being able to deliver drugs to people who need them. It was so cool. I walked in and went, holy smokes, this, these people can support us. They can support GE. They can support the whole process. There are places out there like that. And they don't have to implement those tools all the time, but they got their jets on the runway waiting. They scramble and they go. It's really cool to see that. So this product right now is the product. I'm not kidding you. You look at this. This is the product we're involved in. Now, my company, like I said, there were 25 people. We got a class 10,000 ISO 
seven uh, clean room. We're manufacturing this for uh, GE. So uh, we're making the disposable set that goes into uh, this hyperpolarizer. So I don't even know what the next slide is. Oh, I'm going to show you the company now. There's Dean, our machinist, doing everything manually. We don't do anything CNC in-house. We send it out when we want it done CNC. This is craftsmanship. So I've got Dean in there who knows what he's doing. There's uh, Rebecca Lazan, and she's uh, priming a, a genome mapping card. That's that card that we took from $68, odd, you know, $68 and 18 layers down to three. So uh, Rebecca's uh, going to be working on a cell harvester system uh, for one of our clients. This is a, a pop-up clean room that we isolate from our main clean room. This one allows us to do experimental uh, runs uh, on different types of devices. So two engineers. we got engineers right there, right in front of you. Engineers working in the prototype clean room. This is, uh, this is Dr. Pablo Sanchez in our blood lab uh, hooking the uh, lung up to uh, the perfusion system. And uh, behind him is my very good buddy, Lawrence Jones. Uh, Lawrence is an undegreed engineer. Uh, went three years to the University of Michigan. I met him in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And uh, the thing I had to do uh, 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 to one of my peers was uh, in 1995 to go to Lawrence in, uh, in the CAD room at the Green Party of Asker and say, Lawrence, I took a job in Colorado. I'm going out there with Medtronic. He says, really? He's a real quiet guy. He says, really? He says, when are you going out there? I said, June. He says, well, that's convenient. He says, because I took a job out there with Kobe. <laughs> so, oh. I said, did they give you a reload package? He said, no. I said, they gave me one, so let's take all your junk and put it in my garage. <laughs> and when they show up to move my stuff, they'll move yours too. <laughs> so, that's what we did. Um, some of the guys working at the bench, working on, uh, working on one of the experiments. Uh, we have a very casual environment. When customers come in, you know, uh, we dress it up a little bit, but uh, I want these guys to be... Uh, to be comfortable with what they're doing. Um, the young man sitting down there is one of our most recent hires, Alec. I don't think I've heard Alec say three words. Um, and uh, Sharp, electrical engineer, we hired an electrical engineer. <laughs> and he knows some software too. Oh. So, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, we do have somebody who can manage software. We have actually a, a recognized FDA expert with software, but we don't execute it in house, we just manage it. That's what, you know, sometimes that's what you want to do. Just have somebody who's aware. Uh, so we have the prototyping lab with the laser cutters. You see Dom, uh, Dom is playing with something there in the face mask. I don't know how well you can see that. Um, but then they have the blood lab where we can work with tissue and, and organs and, and all sorts of uh, gooey things. And um, then we have the uh, device integration lab where we can take the, 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 the wet stuff and the hardware and the disposable and put them together and see how they work. Then we have an assembly floor, and you can see in the assembly floor several of those uh, uh, lung perfusion systems being built. And um, uh, then we have the ISO 7 uh, clean room uh, where we process and build our prototypes. And we're very proud of the fact that we could do that, be able to get this stuff into a clinical environment. And so that's just kind of a look at the team. And um, that's the gig. How would we do? Oh, my God. It ran over. So sorry. I mean, seriously, that's, that's, how I, that's what gets me up in the morning. Uh, yeah, I feel good. But I don't know. I, seriously, you guys, everything I heard, you, you heard me say here in the area of biology and life sciences, I'm just repeating words that have been pounded into my head. <laughs> it's true. Okay, let's open the floor for questions here for me. Any, any question about anything you saw, uh, you know. Earlier in your tour, you mentioned something about the technology, I think, around the GE process. You said it was like 20 years old when you were going to... Yes, yeah, it was 20 years old. Do you know where you know those parameters I told you about that, that, car, uh, that cancer diagnostic thing? Uh, who could do it? it that, was, that was the problem. There was a, a group in Cambridge that was working on a, a spin lab to take it down to 0.8 Kelvin, and how you get to it down to 8 Kelvin and then expose it to the magnetic field. But then, even if you accomplish that, the whole idea that you have a 63-second half-life I mean, the guy who invented this technology is up for a Nobel Prize, but 20 years ago they knew about this. About, <coughs> and there are other cells that they can look at, but it's the implementation. You're going to find that in your careers, but yeah, that's... 
That's the way that works. So, are there any similar? Uh, speak, speak up so we can hear. Are there any similar competing companies to the one we work? Okay, I like to say no. <laughs> no, no. I like to say no because there are companies. I guarantee there's a company that does everything we do in one area, little area better than we do, but they don't need to. Okay, you know it's like a it's like a good lead. It's a note you go out on and the note you come back in on. Right. So, so um, uh, no, there's nobody doing what we do, and we know that. Okay. And and and. Uh, so it's mainly companies working with you. And work, and companies working with us. People are trying to do this model, but we've also gained some intellectual property and patents along the way. So we're, you know, I always consider it a, a chase. You know, there, and there's a company in Bechtel, in in Ohio, and they're a research-based company. They do a lot of grant work. And they talk about what we do. They don't do it like us. I know that. They call us and talk to us. How you guys doing? We're doing pretty good. What, what do you want? So, so, so anyway. Okay. Questions? Yes. How? Go ahead. Grab the top How are you encouraging creativity among your workers? Um. You know, it's a really good question. We do it by a defenses down environment. That's it. I, by 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 in, encouraging them to try things. I tell them try things. You know, one of the hardest things you'll ever do in your career. And this is a slight deviation, but I think it's related to your question. One of the hardest things you'll ever do in your career is let somebody else do something that you're an expert at. Whatever you're really really good at, you're going to have somebody in your company that that is going to do that because you're going to move on. Mine happens to be designing. I've got all these designers, and I want to interfere with their design. And I've learned that, yeah, I don't need to. They're going to come up with their own ideas. They're going to make it work. And they're going to learn. And that's what Tim Crewall taught me. He's an educator. You've got to let people fail. I remember the first time I, that, uh, that Tim exposed me to uh, a person in our group that was trying to do something that was obviously over their head. And I said, Tim, it's obviously over that person's head. What are you doing? He said, don't worry about it. He says, it's not critical. They're going to learn from it, and then they won't do it again, and we'll move on. He was an educator in a big company, so that's how we encourage it. You know, I try to do that. I don't always do it, but how do you prioritize what sorts of projects that you're going to work on, or how do you choose, you know, the next thing that you're going to do? Um, uh, that's that's a good question. They they find us. We don't really do any advertising. Uh, we don't have like a backlog of programs. But, but uh, it, they kind of filter themselves out by intellectual property, by what they want to do. The most common thing we have going on, and this is kind of a bummer, because I was taking a tour today and some of the folks saw me on the phone trying to negotiate a uh, situation. We've got a customer right now that clearly wants us for our intellect. They want to get our ideas and then they want to back out. And I know it, I can smell it, I can sense it. And we're trying to negotiate our way into saying, hey, you don't want to do that. It's a big diagnostic company. They found out about us. So they're, they're, they kind of filter themselves out by default. I'm not going to do it. You know, I've got to feed my people. And, and it's not just the creativity. Uh, it's the ability to carry it through, to make it happen. That's what, you know, they deserve that right to do that. So. What have you learned about uh, cash flow? Um, what did I learn about cash flow? Um, anybody taking thermodynamics in here? <laughs> yeah, okay. You know where you're talking about energy going into a system? Replace that symbol with dollars. All those losses you get. <laughs> cash flow is super important. Cash flow is going to kill a company sooner than anything else. You can have plenty of, of how should I put this? You can have plenty of uh, accounts receivable, um, but in, in running a business, by the way, a good friend of mine, Tom Wackerman, is here. He's a serial entrepreneur. He's been uh, an entrepreneur. He owns applied science and technology here in town. And, um, and uh, Tom's warned me <laughs> several times. You know, it's, it's all about cash flow. It really is. And you've got to, you've got to balance this thing. And then what's, what's funny about it is the biggest customer I have, I won't name them, they just happen to be the biggest company in the world. Um, uh, they paid net 60, net 90. Somewhere in that zone. Holy smokes. I'm funding a 
$200 billion company. But they usually are sympathetic to your needs, and so what they'll do is when I invoice them or they cut a PO, they'll pay me, pay me all up front. I still only get it 6090. So what I do is I, I borrow from from uh, a line of credit. I'll just let you in on another little fact about my company. I have no investors. Um, we have no debt, and um, and uh, we own everything in the company, and uh, that's the way we run. I don't need any money from New York. Don't want any money from New York. I'm just picking on New York for a second, okay? <laughs> Hear me out. I'm not into next quarter. I'm not into the quarter beyond that, okay? I'm not buying and selling stocks based on today's price. That mentality I have no time for. So, so in cash flow, we kind of look at the cash flow. We do our projections. We look at our projects, getting back to the projects. Sometimes we make a decision to go with one customer because of the cash flow that it means to the company and sustaining life. So it's all a balancing act. But uh, was there a specific component to that question? Experience. Yeah, it's just not. Yeah, it's, it, cash flow is cash flow is really important. <laughs> so today. Um, yeah. How do you sell your clients on your process, going ahead and go, skipping the milling parts, going to the molding parts, saying you might have bought this box, but that's not the functional objective? Um, I don't know. Um, you know, we, 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 I've got a, a group of competent people. They hear about us. We use, we use um, uh, references quite a bit. I think, I think you know, it's, it, you know, this is a really important question. This is probably the most important question I've had in a long time. You take a risk, you don't know. But I'm telling you right now, if something's keeping you up at night, and this will happen to you in your career, something's keeping you up, you don't want to expose the weakness of your own design or the design that's in front of you. You get 60% down the road, 70% down the road, and it's quite obvious it's the wrong road. You gotta stop. You gotta stop and you gotta you gotta approach it that way. You've gotta raise your hand. You gotta take the hit. Don't worry, you'll get another job. You gotta you gotta be able to do that. And I can name one customer in particular that was going down that road. They hit a clinical pothole. But because we got them to a certain point as soon as possible, they didn't stick billions into it, they stuck a couple hundred thousand to it. And good for them. You know? So that's really important. I don't know how you do it. You just, you know. Do your best, I guess. So, um, with a different name, owned by somebody else. <laughs> I don't know. I, and I, I'm going to tell you, I didn't see my company. If somebody had asked me that, I'd have given them an answer. If somebody had asked me that ten years ago, and I'd have been dead wrong. Five years ago, I'd have been wrong. I know what I want to do. I want to develop products in the medical field. I never would have guessed in vitro diagnostics. Never in a million years. That wasn't my gig. I knew about it, but I was a therapy type person, cut, stitch, connect, all about therapy. But I'm telling you right now, by the way, this is, a, this is good financial investment uh, advice. Diagnostics is the missing link. You show me a therapy that's in front of the FDA right now, or a therapy that's not working, and I'll show you, I'll show you a missing tool in diagnostics, Viox. Viox was a wonderful drug for 98% of the people. Billions and billions went into that drug. But it had a bad effect on 2%. I'll tell you, those margins are way too high in drug. They were missing a diagnostic test to type the person for any adverse effects from that drug. We're going to get into boutique drug therapy. We're going to get into custom companion diagnostics and therapeutics. That's where we're headed. That's where we have to go. It can't be one car that rolls off the assembly line that does everything. It's not going to do a million, million Lamads and also lug around your, your lumber. So that's, that's, that's where the company's going. So that's what we're caught up in, is this diagnostic world. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to figure out where we're going to end up there. Is it PCR? I don't know. You know, you, you, I saw one of the, the uh, folks here with uh, an idea for uh, a blood glucometer telemetry technology they were working on. 
way cool communications. So, oops. How'd you come up with your name? Huh. Um, well, I told you. Apple, did you with the little I? Actually, um, <coughs> no. And it would, you know, the Nintendo Wii, that whole yeah. thing. We had it three years before, and my brother's a trademark and patent attorney, and uh, they're starting to get into diagnostics and therapeutics at home, and so we're waiting for them to approach us, and we'll send them a letter. Now, how I got into the name was simple. Uh, the logo person at 3M told me it doesn't matter what you name your company. We were putting branding on different medical devices. He said, make your name your logo and your logo your name. Make it one color so you can afford to print it. <laughs> and I started thinking about GE. I don't even see the G and the E in it anymore. anymore. I see that, that uh, logo. I just uh, associate it with Apple. It doesn't say Apple. It's just an apple. You know, it's a, it's a symbol. So you, that's how it came up with it. And the crest was a mistake. It was a circle around the W and I. And I was moving one of the portions, and I grabbed just the inner portion of it, and it made a crest, and I just kept it. Now my son, <laughs> my son, my son, who's a, uh, a, a science student at University of Colorado, uh, pointed out to me that W sub I is a symbol for work going into a system. And so I said that'll work. I'll tell people that. <laughs> so uh, I want to I want to close by saying, and, and I want to close by sincerely expressing that I was blown away by what I saw here. This is not the college I went to. Not at all. And I'm gonna capitalize on that because the reputation that you guys are building right now, I'm just gonna glom onto it. I mean, seriously, I've never seen the tools that you have here in an undergraduate program. And I got, I had just, just addressed my friend directly, Tom, you gotta see one of the instruments here. They got University of Michigan coming over here to use it. We're talking about micro Enstron machines that are capable of real time looking at, at the tissue at a, at a very, very small level. That's cool. And then there were so many other pieces, like the bio lab that, we did, that I saw. Uh, holy smokes. You guys are much better outfitted than I am. Definitely. Take advantage of it. I mean, that stuff, that stuff rings of, of value to the industry. And it won't take long for the industry to figure it out because they want people who have that experience. Because that's what I want. I don't care about many things that you might think are important on a resume. That's, that's the stuff. So I was blown away and, I, was, I, was, uh, and I, I, I felt like I was set up to come in here and talk about stuff that you guys know like the back of your hand. So you guys can figure it all out here. So I appreciate the opportunity. Well, on behalf of the College of Engineering, I'd like to thank Dave and we are so proud of him and also very grateful that he took a lot of this time and that he also knew us here on Saturday morning. So if you have any more questions, you are more than welcome to stop by on Saturday. We are so proud of you again and certainly we are very thankful and grateful. No, you are. Thank you.